Hello, and welcome to Dig It. I'm Peter Brown, and hosting the show with me today is Chris Day. Hi, Chris. Hi, Peter. So today's show is all about orchids. What can you tell us about orchids then, Chris? Oh, well, we have to go back about 300 years in the UK when orchids were first introduced. And um, many of them obviously came from warmer climates, and they were brought over usually by plant explorers in there. Where does the Phalaenopsis and the, the standard orchid come from then, Chris? Is, is it China or...? Uh, yeah, nice warmer climates, South Africa. Tro- okay. Tro- tropical climates where you've got high humidity. Ah, that's the secret, is it, for the orchids? Uh, they need a lot of humidity, unlike, of course, our British natives, which, of course, grow quite well outside in our cool, fairly hospitable uh, spring and summers. Yes, because orchids, you find, they're found all around the world, aren't they? They're not just the ones that we think of in um, our homes with the lovely the moth orchid, um, which is what I think of when people say orchids to me, but no, there's the, now let me think, the bee orchid, is bee it? Orchid, and yeah. the mm. sort of native orchids. Mm, the spot, that, that spot, spotted orchid is the one, yes. I, I, I remember as a child coming across uh, some golf links which were quite close to where I used to live and there was a, a, a very damp area of ground and every... April, May, around about uh, around about this time of the year, they were actually showing their beautiful pink flowers with the spotted leaves. Yeah, because they're not that common, are they? I seem to remember my father taking me to a field um, which was a site of scientific interest. Oh, right, yes. Um, quite near to here, mm. and there's some orchids growing there, and he was saying that, yeah, they... They're not that common and they're, they're quite hard to find. But when they do come into flower, and is it, I'm going to say May, June? Yep. They are beautiful, aren't they? They are. They're, they're, but they're quite small. They're, they're, they're not the easiest things to spot. No, and that, I think that's part of their, their mystery in a way, isn't it? They, they are so elusive uh, in yeah. our, uh, our, our sort of undergrowth, but uh, well worth spotting. And yes, if you come across some on your travels, it's well worth documenting, certainly. Excellent. So later in the show, we're having a chat with Manos uh, from Growth Technology, who is a veritable expert in uh, orchids. My memory is orchids have really sort of grown in popularity over the last few years, haven't they, Chris? Yeah. Um, and certainly when I was at college, it was all about the spider plant. Can you... Yeah. Uh, so what you, what's you your give, recollections? I was going to say, you're giving your age away there. Please, uh, <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, certainly the, the sort of 70s was sort of spider plants. I think the 80s was parlor palms. The 90s have been very much about chrysanthemums. And then really in the noughties and now into the, 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 the teens, we're into obviously more orchids because obviously there's a better range coming through from the, the gardening world and of course foliage house plants which is which is really good because that sort of really lends the fact that these a lot of these plants have good sort of qualities and properties to the garden i I certainly know know, recently you've seen quite a few posters around the place with promoting air quality Mm. and certainly a lot of house plants produce oxygen and use oxygen in the day mm-hmm. however at night they just produce carbon dioxide and use oxygen whereas orchids aren't quite like that they are they? actually yeah there are a lot of those are, are the opposite actually and they emit oxygen through the night time which is obviously beneficial in certain parts of the house perhaps definitely and so you know, they, they do produce oxygen in the day as well they do they? they do so yes. they do photosynthesize they most definitely do and uh, there's just the metabolism and the fact that they, they breathe effectively through their leaves and through their aerial roots, which we'll find out a little bit more in the in the podcast. Okay, so they're probably quite good. Where would you put an orchid then? Where do you think is a good? Yeah, so I think light is quite important. Not too much, not too little. I think that's quite see- the secret of success with orchids is to get the right sort of balance. So maybe somewhere like a bedroom, so long as you're good and yeah. open your curtains in the morning, <laughs> give them some nice light, and then that way they're going to oxygenate the indeed the room all through the day and at night. That that's very true. Yeah, good, good, good uh, candidate there for for the bedroom. With so very few plants you could actually put in that location. But it's interesting, piece. There's been lots of research you mentioned about uh, the uh, the air purification qualities. And I think uh, there's probably about four or five popular foliage plants which come into that category, including the peace lily and the parlor palm and the ladder fern, one of the, the wonderful nephilipis ferns as well, which are quite difficult to keep. But often you see those in, in some of the glossy magazines used in uh, in nice palatial bedrooms, which perhaps perhaps an orchid would be better served 
Now, Chris, I just want to clarify something here. I, I was growing spider plants in college, and um, I don't want you to think that I was <laughs> growing them back in the 70s. I'm not quite that old. <laughs> no. I, I, I just managed to grow them um, with a reasonable amount of success, and also spathophyllums I used to manage to grow with a reasonable amount of success just because they're so easy, and they really are quite bulletproof, aren't they? They are, yeah, the good old peace lily. Um, and, of course, they produce those wonderful white flowers, and, of course, they've got a scent as well. Mm, they're good. And as a student, um, yeah. that's quite useful. Quite useful. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so I mean, in, in view of that, in view of the fact that we've seen so many resurgences of, of houseplants, especially all the, the types for air purification, it's really heartening that uh, today we're going to be uh, welcoming Manos Kalanos from Grove Technology to look at the wonderful world of, of orchids and how they're impacting on our, our homes uh, and oh, how we've embraced them as a, a wonderful species that aren't too difficult to grow. And that's what we like, isn't it? Plants that are easy to grow. So let's hear what Manos has to say about them. Manos, welcome. And we're delighted that you could join us today on, on Dig It. Um, how, how are we finding you? Uh, very well. The weather is, is sunny. It's Friday. So all is good. That's excellent. Now, obviously, many of our customers will be familiar with, with yourself and your, your colleague, uh, Peter White, who come and join us for your very popular Orchid Days. Let's hope we can resume these soon. Yes, yes, indeed. So, my first question, really, Manos, obviously you're very, very keen on your subject, and obviously, where did your fascination for orchids begin? Uh, as a child, <laughs> I dare say. Uh, I grew up in a, in a small Greek island called Samos, uh, and my, uh, my family um, are farmers, so um, uh, I spotted uh, bee orchids, and monkey orchids, as we call them, okay. in uh, in near our fields. Uh, and um, then, you know, I remember asking my dad, and, and he explaining me to me. They, they are, we don't we have types of them in in the UK, but they're more prevalent in um, in the Mediterranean. They are bee orchid is basically they grow in soil, and the flowers resemble bees. And um, the 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 uh, male bees think they are female bees, and they call and to them, they try to do their business, you know, <laughs> but poor bees, you know, nothing happens, and then they just go off. But in, in the whole process, they pollinate these orchids. They are they're beautiful. There are many, many uh, types of bee orchid, orchids. So uh, that's how uh, I started. And then when I was a, a young lad, uh, I, I worked for some time in, um, in, in an orchid uh, nursery again in Samos, where it's one of the few places. There's only two orchid nurseries in Samos, mm -hmm. where we used to grow. Uh, they still do, do actually. They grow cymbidium orchids, and that's how I get I got to know more about uh, about orchids and as I get fascinated. I mean, how how can you not get fascinated by these extraordinary plants? Exactly. Beautiful flowers, you know, and and showy flowers. There, uh, yeah. Yeah, and that, I was going to say, man, at that time, were they grown indoors on, on the Greek islands? Were they actually grown as an indoor plant? Or is no, this... in, in, in Greece, we don't... Uh, the, uh, the, the common orchids we have in the UK, the moth orchids, are not as popular because um, it is a little bit too hot for them to, to flower in the summer. Mm -hmm. Also, we're not, we're not as house plant oriented as, as uh, we are here. We are more oriented in, in garden plants. Um, so they were, they, the cymbidiums were, were grown on the island. A few, very, very few were sold in the island. Mostly they were, they were flown to, um, to Holland okay. for, to sell. So how did your, your career then in, in, uh, in orchid growing sort of follow from, from that? Was there, was there a particular point where you, you decided that, yes, they, they were going to be my, my, my main passion? No, it, it just things developed. I I, um, I always liked plants, and uh, I did a degree in in uh, in Greece about plants, and then I went to talk, to know more, uh, and I did enjoy student life, to be honest. <laughs> okay. Uh, so and then I came to England. I did a master's, and then I did a, a PhD in plant physiology, where I studied magnolias, um, and then I worked for a number of companies. Uh, uh, including uh, uh, an orchid nursery in, in, in Holland. Uh, uh, and then 
things led to me working for uh, for a UK company uh, called Growth Technology, who specializes in orchids and house plants. And there, I found more uh, more scope to develop to develop my passion for orchids and house plants in in general. I mean, I've always had orchids at my home, etc., and house plants. And uh, I don't. I think I think I think it is well proven. It is scientifically proven that we do have a tendency to draw. To plant and then have plants around us. This is, you know, this is mm-hmm. a part of our DNA, if you want. Yeah, I mean, I remember my my years when I started off in commercial horticulture, and orchids were always seen to be. This is the late nineteen seventies and eighties. You know, very expensive, and you you wouldn't see them, you know, being sold in, in garden centres or the supermarkets. Then things have moved on, haven't they? Yes, uh, and it, it, uh, orchids have always been popular uh, uh, for the last the last two hundred years. They, they, they have uh, people have died for orchids, many people. Um, but uh, what made them very popular is uh, adv- uh, advances in micropropagation, where you can produce them uh, very cheaply, uh, and also central heating in our houses, which which gives them a. a yeah, I know it sounds strange, but a, a quite similar environment to what they have normally, or at least an environment they can tolerate and thrive and produce these magnificent flowers. Manas, you, you mentioned about obviously growth technology, which is obviously the company you're actively involved in. Obviously, we we at uh, Buckingham Garden Centre sell obviously a lot of your your products. Um, what's about? Can you tell us a little bit about the ethos of of growth technology? Um, the ethos is uh, which comes down to its founder. Charles Gunstone, who is uh, sadly not very well at the moment, uh, it comes down to, to, to the founder who wanted to introduce uh, innovative and at the same time very high quality plants. Uh, as, as a person, uh, he would never compromise on quality, and, and this is the what the, the ethos that that goes throughout the company. We produce good innovative products, but also we do cut no that no uh, we make no shortcuts on uh, on quality um, as a company commercial company every commercial company has to make at some point um, a, a balance between com- quality and uh, and cost and uh, he never uh, he never uh, we uh, weathered in, in, in his uh, commitment to quality products for the plant the, the focus of what we do he kept saying again and again is the plant what is the best for the plant and then mm. the price that we have to charge for it is is, is irrelevant in a way and that's good um i was just interesting as well i mean obviously a lot of uh, well, lots of garden centers get involved in charity work does growth technology support any any charities anything orchid associated uh, yes, yes. Uh, apart from the from regular donations to various charities uh, uh, every year um we very much support um, uh, Action Aid, who is involved in uh, uh, in uh, helping uh, women and children in developing countries, uh, and um, they also make some significant contributions to the local uh, hospital in Tonton in acquiring an MRI scanning machine. That's very yeah, very charitable. That's good to be involved in. Um, Okay, so so moving over to the orchids then. Obviously, in the UK, we are blessed with a couple of really good orchid growers. Um, I mean, they're producing literally millions of plants these days because people tend to think all the orchids come from from Holland or or further afield, but that's not not necessarily true. No, no, uh, it is it is true that that mo- most of them do come from Holland. But uh, as you say, we we are blessed to have a couple of companies to produce uh, plants in the UK. And are they, are they mainly the the moth orchid? Um, yes, yes, yeah. the most popular ones. I mean, Seventy to to eighty eighty five percent of the orchids uh, bought by by people are the moth uh, the moth orchids or Phalaenopsis orchids as they they know. Mm. And I think well, we we all can uh, understand that in view of the fact that the amount of sort of questions we get, you know, week to week at the garden centre. Usually, if people have got more than one, which most people have on their windowsills, obviously, how to to get them to reflower, which we'll we'll touch on a little bit later. But um, you know, can you explain why the the Phalaenopsis or the Bloch orchid is just so widely grown? I mean, you've sort of hinted that it's uh, it's more res- resilient, perhaps, to our central heating and our more uh, dry atmospheres. But uh, why else um, do you, why else do you think it's become more popular? It is very popular because uh, for a number of reasons. It is um, it is very 
easy to grow at home. The, uh, the, the flowers can last for months upon months. It can flower profusely, whereas a lot of other orchids would, would only flower once a year. Uh, easy to look after. And um, due to all the work that has been done, there is, it comes in all uh, shapes and sizes um, and, and colors of the flowers. So it, it is, when, you, uh, when now you talk about an orchid, this is the orchid that everybody has, has, in, uh, has in mind. There's, there's, it is so easy to, to, to amend, if you want to, to play with, uh, uh, as in making every single color available. There's, um, and, and different uh, shapes, different, uh, um, different sizes of it. It's, it's um, yeah, it is one of the best plants and easiest to grow at home. And, hence its popularity. Yeah, I mean, I'm thinking about, you know, when it first sort of emerged that moth orchids were going to become very popular in the UK. Um, obviously, for the, for the numbers we are buying as, as customers, as gardeners, how are those sort of number of plants being produced? Because obviously it's, it's not, they're not going to be grown from seed, I suspect. It's going to be something a little bit more... No, simple. no, there's... Um, yeah, they, they, as, as plants, they have a, a very particular strategy when it comes to seeds, which is why it is not really easy at all to produce them from seeds. They produce masses of seeds, but they have no... Uh, no storage of any nutrients or any other substances to grow on their own, so they have to, to um, they have to find a, a mycorrhiza or fungus in, in the wild to, to grow in, in, in uh, uh, to grow with. Uh, but commercially, they are grown um, in micropropagation. So you take a meristem, which is the actively growing plant of the of the plant, you divide it. Uh, and you take a few cells at a time, you put them in, in, um, in, in appropriate conditions in, a, in, in agar, and then you can grow many uh, thousands of plants which are identical to each other. Oh, right. So these are basically, um, basically clone, cloned plants then? Yes, yes they are, they are, yeah, they're all clones. Well, that's great. And, that, and I suppose in that way you, you, you keep the cost down because you can be producing many, yes, many yes. thousands. Mm, okay. Um, just touching actually, Manos, on the um, on the colours, um, we we obviously get all the sort of uh, the pinks and the whites and the the blotches. Now, anecdotally, are they more difficult to flower the, the coloured ones to the to the just the straightforward white varieties? Uh, no, not at all. Um, they um, uh, uh, there, there may be. Some hybrids, and there is so many coming up on on uh, on uh, on the market every year that is difficult to know. So there may be some correlation with some particular hybrids that happen to be uh, pink or, or any other color that are difficult. But there is no strong correlation between the color of the of the of the flower and how easy an orchid is to grow. Um, one thing about the color is. Um, there are some uh, blue orchids and some um, orange orchids that are not actually blue or orange. They are the flowers have been. What they do is they, in in uh, when they're grown, they grow, you, you put uh, they put a, a syringe or, or they put a, a blue dye, a food uh, grade uh, dye, into the flower, so it becomes uh, either blue or orange. But then, when the flower, when the flower, uh, when the plant reflowers, then it will become it will come back as white. Ah, that explains it. Yes, yes, I, I know. I know. As a garden centre, we try and steer away from those sort of plants, but I know they can be very popular. You know, there's no accounting for people's taste yeah. these days. Yeah, but uh, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Now, um, phal- phalaenopsis um, are a, an epiphytic orchid. Is that is that correct? And could you tell us a little bit more about? The, the, the different types of uh, ways orchids can grow uh, naturally and uh, in, in containers? Uh, yes, of course. Um, orchids are the biggest family of flowering plants. They, uh, they grow on every single continent on Earth, apart from Antarctica, and they grow in all sorts of environments, normal environments where other plants will find it very difficult to grow. So they can grow a, a, a lot of them. They grow in soil, a lot of them. Uh, but in the tropics, they mostly grow on top of the on top of trees or on top of uh, stones, etc. Um, they have adopted this strategy on growing on top of the trees to get to the light. 
um, which is if, if there's huge trees around, then it, it's not easy to uh, to get it at, at the bottom of the of the of the of the of the forest. And um, this is what living on top of trees is what makes them. Uh, a little bit special, if you want, in terms of growing them at uh, at home. Epiphyte is actually, fun enough, a Greek word, and it means on top of a plant, with, okay. because they live on top of the plant. They live in symbiosis with, if you want, with with the plant. Well, they don't harm the plant. They're not parasites. They don't take anything from the plant as such, uh, so they they don't harm it. Right. Well, that's, that's good to know. Um, so as far as people growing, say, the, the epiphytic type orchids, like the, the moth orchid, you have to be then a little bit more careful in the, the care, perhaps, as far as maybe watering? Yes. The, the, what this, the, the implication of this for growing at home is it means that it, does, it should not be grown in soil. So one implication is about where you're going to grow it. The main reason you have it, we have it at home in 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 a pot. Uh, if your home, if if the home had high enough humidity, for example, the orchid wouldn't really need to be in a pot or anything. But okay. we do put it in a pot because we need to keep a, a moisture around its roots and because it needs to be supported so it can you know it can produce the flower. That is the main reason we put it in a pot. Otherwise, you could very happily live with its roots floating about. Um, in fact, there are orchids, uh, some, a cousin of, uh, of uh, the moth orchid, Phalaenopsis, is called, they're called Vandas, and they normally are, so, are, are sold um, without any pot. Indeed, yes, and they, they look quite unusual when you see them sort of hanging from, uh, from sort of yeah. hooks and such like, but they look amazingly yeah, different. Yeah, it's difficult to grow them like this. You could, in theory, grow a Phalaenopsis like this. The problem is that you would need to spray it because... Mm-hmm. They they like a humidity of say seventy to eighty percent, whereas in our home is about forty to fifty. You'll need to spray it every four five times every every day. Who has time or, or, or you know the ability to do this? Otherwise, in theory, you could grow you could grow it like this, but it's obviously much more difficult. Uh, to do than in uh, putting it in a pot with a bit of bark around it that keeps it moist. moist yeah. So uh, for those people who grow moth orchids or maybe are thinking for the first time to give one a go, is there any sort of tips on the watering side? Is there, is there, should be doing it on a, on a regular basis or do you have to use the judgment of what the plant needs? Is there a few pointers? Ah, moth orchids, Phalaenopsis, uh, luckily they actually tell you when they need water. You see, the roots are, are, are reservoirs of water. So when they are green, you, you need to consider watering does not need to be regular because the weather, the conditions that the plant experiences are not regular. It, it, it's not the same. If, if you have your plant next to a radiator, it will need more watering than a plant away from a radiator. In the summer, as we all know, plants will need more regular watering than, than in the winter. Uh, light. If, if where you have your plant is plenty of light, again, it'll need more watering than if the plant is, uh, uh, is in a slightly darker place. Plants down the south, in, say, the south coast, will need more regular watering than the same plant up in Scotland because it receives less light and, and the... Um, the, the, the temperature overall is, is a little bit less. So the focus in, in doing anything to orchid to any other plant should be the plant. Luckily, as I said, Phalaenopsis tells you when it needs watering. So when these roots are green, the plant is telling you it doesn't need any water. When they, turn, when they start turning silver, check with the pot, and if the pot feels a little bit light, then give it plenty of water. If it doesn't, then leave it a few more days and check again. If the roots have gone grey, then it definitely needs watering. Okay. Well, the plant really is, so is, is, is telling us. If you follow that rhythm, you, if you follow that guide, you'll come to a rhythm. Because who, who, and, and it's going to be different to everybody's, everybody's house. And, but there will be a rhythm of watering them once every... 10 to 14 days in the summer, 
maybe every week in the really, really, you know, hot weather of July, really. But again, every year is different. And every two, three, possibly four weeks in the middle of the winter when it is dark, and uh, even in a well-heated house, the temperature will not be as hot as, as normal. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks, Manos. And I think putting that about water uh, and the, the prospects of having to, to water on a on a pre-recommended restriction rate is, is obviously quite uh, quite tricky for some people. But we mentioned that these plants obviously grow within on trees, maybe within the tree as an epiphyte. So does that mean the aspect where you actually grow the plant in the house is, uh, is important? Like, like most house plants, orchids don't like direct sunlight, especially in the summer. Mm-hmm. The, the light, so what I do with, with my orchids is I put them on a south facing window sill from late October when the sun quality and, and amount drops dramatically. And then as soon as the sun picks up, uh, sometime in, in January, then I move them to another window sill where they can get very little uh, direct sunlight. Even three or four hours of direct sunlight over three or four days would normally scorch them. The sign, signs of, of very of, of high light. If you having the plant will can can live even in in, in a lot of light on a little light, but Signs of too much light are few leaves, mm-hmm. small leaves, and on the reddish side, on the re- a little bit red. The, the redness on the leaves is a sign of stress for the plant. And again, signs of, uh, but, but plants that receive a lot of light will uh, flower profusely. It, it's, whereas on the other hand, signs of little light is a lot of leaves, uh, very big, sometimes floppy, quite green, but not regular, uh, not regular flowering. If you have a plant at your home and it has like ten leaves, big, glossy, le- green leaves, and it hasn't flowered for, I'd say, ten months, chances are it receives very little light. North-facing windows can be not adequate light, especially if there's any, some curtains in front of them or, or some, um, some uh, blinds or, or that, that sort of thing. Again, south-facing window shield, south-facing, south-facing windows are good even in the summer as long as the plant is not on the window shield to get the direct sun. So all you could do in January, February is have it in, on the window shield in the dark winter months but in January, just bring it a meter inside, so it is still in a bright room. It receives a lot of light, but it doesn't receive any direct sunlight. Mm, yeah, that's, that's. There's not many plants that can do well on a south-facing window sill from say February onwards to, to to September. Even cacti, they will get scorched because the sun, the the the, the glass on the window concentrates as well. The the, the sun, it's, it's not a, a good environment to be at. Mm, that's good. I think that advice is spot on, really, because we as, as house plant lovers these days, we tend to be, you know be putting lots of plants into our homes and not really thinking about the the aspects. A lot of them are, are going to be that needing. is the, the the most important thing I think mm-hmm. you you need to do, and that is the key to success with with plants. Is when you buy the plant, when you get the plant, think think about where what you want to do with the plant. Where, where, don't think about yourself. Oh, I like this color. I'm gonna buy. You know, I'm gonna buy this orchid. Oh, I like. I like this plant. I'm gonna buy it. No, no. Ask. The, the garden centers are very good in, in in knowing about plants. And what I recommend to people is buy your plants, buy your orchids from somebody who sells orchids, stroke plants throughout the year, not from your little or your Tesco that will get the plants. Put them right in front of of a of a cold because the, the people don't know they put them right in front of a cold entrance. You get a cold draft inside, it damages the plant, but you can't see it. You take it at home. Three weeks later, the plant is is uh, is is dropping its flowers or is dropping its buds. It's not it's nothing you have done. It's it what happened at the place it was. I think I think there you're right there. Slow reacting, 
slowly I can plant. If you if you say, oh, I want a, a, a nice plant for my for my bathroom, okay, have a think. What are the conditions in the bathroom? The light is not great. Uh, it's quite warm, it's quite humidity. What kind of plant likes these uh, likes these uh, uh, these conditions? And you know, a spasifilum comes to mind. That would do well in a bathroom, but not necessarily an orchid. No. Orchids would be very good, for example, for bedrooms, because like cacti, they produce oxygen at night. So other plants are not really good for uh, for orchids if you think about it, because they take oxygen at night. That's not what you want when you sleep. You want oxygen. So, but orchids and cacti are good for bedrooms as long as there is enough light. Yeah, yeah that's good. Um, with with moth orchids in particular, you tend to buy them um, in, in containers which are transparent, uh, clear. Um, obviously, we we tend to at the garden centre here sell things like cymbidiums and. Uh, Miltonias and all the other more unusual varieties of orchids, but they tend to be in solid pots. Is mm-hmm. that is that the rationale for the roots that they need light, and that's why they're in in clear pots? A clear pot is good for any orchid. Mostly, it's for us because we can see the roots, and the roots of the orchid, I say, can indicate when it needs watering of the moth orchid. Whereas on the others, they don't, they, they don't change enough, so there is not great advantage commercially in putting them in, in, in a clear orchid. But for phalaenopsis, there is an advantage, for, mostly for us, to see any problems in, in the root zone, to see when perhaps it needs watering, etc., etc. But an orchid, any orchid, could do well in any pot. The important a clear pot is good for the orchid and it's good for us. But what is essential, if you want, in terms of a pot, is drainage and aeration. Uh, the pot that the orchid needs to be in, it ought to have a lot of drainage holes and ideally a dome, which helps with, with aeration. Not uh, There are clear pots on the market which are not great. They don't have many drainage holes or a dome. Okay. Uh, the important thing, as I said, clear pot is good, but a lot of holes for drainage and ideally a dome for aeration is essential. I know one, one observation I've made sometimes when I've been going shopping in, in garden centres and on the high street is uh, moth orchids, which have been put into um, sort of glass vases or into solid containers. And um, obviously, the, therefore, the, the poor roots are completely devoid of light. And often when you we have issues with uh, customers having uh, problems with their orchids, that's often where they've purchased them from, where they've not actually had the, the plant sort of marketed in the right container. So what your advice would be if somebody buys something already planted, is it better to make sure it goes into a container where the, uh, the, light can, the, the roots can be seen? If it is seen, yes, it is, it is good. If... Sometimes you think, again, you go about this focus on, on what the plant needs. Uh, a lot of florists, I think, do this. They put them, they put the plants looking nice in, in nice looking containers without thinking what the plant actually needs. And they put them in containers with sometimes no drainage. How, how, can, how can the plant survive in, in these conditions? Exactly. Uh, it's not impossible, but it is way, way too tricky for, for anybody. So in, in, in such a... a, a, a if I was to buy an orchid, I wouldn't. But if I was offered an orchid that that is in a container of of uh, with no drainage, I would I would definitely change it uh, because that that's much better for the for the plant. Yeah, good advice, I think. There, um, Manus. Obviously, um, growth technology um, has a lot of products, and it's uh, and one of those, of course, is 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 orchid feeds. Now, um, could you tell us a little bit about the 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 rationale for feeding orchids? Is there any guidelines our, uh, our, our audience would, would benefit um, from? Like, well, look, like any plant, like any living organism, orchids need feed. Um, what is special about that is that they don't need an awful lot of feeding. So you could use a lot of fertilizers, but if you were to use a normal fertilizer for, say, normal house plants, you would very likely burn the roots because it would be way too concentrated. What is special about orchid fertilizers is that they are very weak. Uh, and what is special about growth technology fertilizers 
is that they contain all essential nutrients. Uh, it is very, very difficult to put all the nutrients that plants need, 12 the number, in a bottle and, and to stay in the liquid rather than all everything goes to the, to the bottom. Um, I challenge any, anybody who listens to go and find any fertilizer that has all 12 nutrients. Most, most manufacturers would, would put maybe five, six. I've seen a fertilizer just earlier on, online. It has two elements in it. That's it. Nothing else. Mm. Nitrogen and uh, potassium. Nothing else. But the plants need a lot of other stuff. So, um, especially because orchids uh, are in bark, which has no, uh, uh, no nutritional value uh, whatsoever. So, um, there's, there's many ways to feed an orchid. And what I, what I say, in, in making it easy for, for, for the people, what I recommend is that if you have a couple of orchids, uh, we make a product called Orchid Mist. Again, it contains all, all essential nutrients. And what you can do is you spray the leaves and mostly the roots and the bark three, four times a week, even more. And that is a good enough way to look after your orchid uh, if you have one or two and you don't want to do too much. Uh, you're giving it food and at the same time humidity. But if you have a few more orchids or if you have uh, time and inclination, then it is better to use a proper fertilizer. And for the moth orchid, the one, you will only need one, the orchid focus bloom, uh, where if you dilute it into the water, uh, every other time you water the orchids and you just water the orchid uh, as and when it needs it. But I say every other time you put a little bit of orchid focus bloom into uh, into the water. If you're using the orchid focus bloom, you can, of course, use the orchid mist as well, but you could just simply use rain water or soft water to mist the leaves and the bark in between, uh, in between uh, waterings. Uh, because humidity is also very important for orchids. Another way to increase humidity is to put on a humidity tray, which is just a small saucer or, or um, with with some gravel, and then you sit the orchid uh, on top. Perfect. Yeah, that should keep them nice and happy. And I think uh, obviously this, you know, we're uh, we're in the sort of late spring now, and we're obviously thinking about plants coming into growth. So I suppose if you've got some um, uh, moth orchids especially which are in between flowerings should you start to think about maybe just upping the amount of, of feed you're, you're giving them or no the you will up it in a way because because of the good conditions you will be watering it regularly more more regularly mm -hmm. so whereas in a, this is the, the way why i think it's, it's really good the way i suggest every other watering whereas Every other watering in spring means you will be giving it uh, feed, say every three, maybe four weeks. Yeah. Whereas every other watering in, in winter, it means you'd give it some food once every six to eight weeks. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, good, good point. So by, 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 yeah. by giving, by, by com combining the, 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 the feeding with the watering, you are responding to its needs rather than giving it feed every week or whatever. Right, Manus. Um, a lot of people obviously grow phalaenopsis, and they mm -hmm. and they enjoy them. The, the flowers are, the, are obviously bloom, and then at some point, the plant comes to a bit of a halt. It stops producing flowers, um, and often yeah. people are left with these very long, uh, sort of uh, large shoots, which are obviously devoid of blooms. What advice would you give to encourage the re reblooming of your your moth orchid? Well. Let me say that first, that the plant is not our slave. <laughs> okay. You know, it has a life on its own, and it, it lives, it makes leaves, then it makes a flower, then it makes leaves, it makes flower. You know, it, it's not, there I say, our slave flowers, and then it flowers some more, and flowers some more. It, it, it has a natural rhythm to, to its life. And the natural rhythm for a phalaenopsis is that it would make a flower, then it will make uh, a leaf, and then it will make another flower, etc., etc. Because it needs, it, it, it's like a factory. You know, it needs uh, um, support for for the flower. The flower is, is a little bit of a luxury, if you want. It needs first to make its leaves, make sure it has enough enough food to support the roots, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. Now, 
When towards the end of flowering, it is true with phalaenopsis and only with phalaenopsis compared to all other orchids, you have an option. The option is if it is a single stem orchid, right? If you notice, sometimes that single stem has got side stems. And that to me is a great value orchid to take. If your orchid has got already enough, a lot of stems, then at the end, then you can just let it flower. And when it finishes, you cut off the stem at the very bottom of it. And if you don't like looking at just an orchid because it's very plain, etc., then you can place it somewhere else, give it a little bit of time, and then when it is about to flower again, you can bring it into the kitchen or into the living room and display its flowers. It doesn't have to be in the same place all the time. If it is a, 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 a if if the stem, the flower stem of the orchid doesn't have any side stems, towards the end of the flowering, you could encourage it to make. Whether it actually makes or not is really up to the orchid itself, but you can, as I said, nudge it, encourage it. And the way to nudge it is when it has only one, when it is on its last flower, you count four tiny little buds on the stem from the bottom. Mm-hmm. And you cut it one centimeter above the third or fourth little bud, mm-hmm. uh, depending on which one is sort of the fatter one. That way, you, you you should do this before it completely finishes flowering, because by the time it finishes completely the flowering, then the the stem has gone a little bit dry inside. So you need to, when it, you need to do it while while it is still act. So. You cut above the third or fourth little bud, and then you wait. And within a month or so, these buds should develop into a new side shoot with more flowers, which are likely to be smaller than than the normal, but it will flower quicker than otherwise. Um, If you want to further encourage the plant, when you cut the stem after the third or fourth node, if it is the summer, you could place it in the coolest place you have in your house. That's not necessarily in the winter, but in the summer, in the middle of the summer, it would help to put it somewhere as cool as, as possible uh, for about four to six weeks. And then you bring it into the no, into its normal position and it should then make a side shoot. It, it's a matter of, of personal preference. If it makes a side shoot, obviously the next, big flower spike will come significantly later, but you get this extra flower spike earlier. Mm. So a lot of people also have this issue where they, uh, the, the buds form on the moth orchid, especially if it's new new uh, flowers, and then they, they drop off and they fall off without actually opening. Um, now that can be very frustrating to say the least. So <laughs> what, 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 what's gone wrong there then, Manos? If... if Flower bud, uh, so drop, yeah, the, the, the bud drop or, or even flower drop, if it happens within, say, three or four weeks after you bought the orchid, chances are something happened at the place they had it. Normally, it's the result of an env- environmental shock. Mm-hmm. And, i.e., the plant got either too dark or too dry or too cold. So it could be. Like um, you have it on your windowsill in the in the winter, right? Uh, and you open the, the the window to get some fresh air. In the the, the the temperature outside is like I don't know twelve degrees. The, this cold shock it doesn't take it wouldn't take more than two or three times. Do this two or three times, and the plant goes shut down, drops all its leaves. It tries to recover from from the shock. Or it could be that it develops the buds. And then November comes, and the sun hides for like six weeks. A good, healthy plant will just keep the buds, go to pause, open them later on in January when when it is. But sometimes it can happen that it gives up hope of ever seeing the sun again and drops the drops the bud. Or the last uh, one, which happens, the last one, which is. It's about to open the bud, and then it's left with no water for I don't know how long. It gets very dry, and then the buds drop. In that, in the last occasion, the buds would would more likely not open but stay on the plant, uh, but not not always. So 
something like this is, or if, or if all the flowers fall at the same time, that's again environmental shock. Something happens, either too dark, too dry, or too cold. Yeah, yeah good old stress has hit it. The, hit the plant a, about point. three to four weeks earlier, they are slow reacting plants. Yeah. That's why I said if, you, if, if this happens within three or four weeks after you bought it, chances are it happened at the place where it was. Yeah. Uh, Martha, repotting, I mean, a lot of people, certainly when they come into your, uh, when we have our orchid days and you're giving your advice and your MOTs for, for orchids, come with plants with roots sort of burgeoning out of the pot. I mean, almost, uh, they almost become like spider-like in their, their growth <laughs> with these tentacles of, of aerial roots. And I suppose the, the question is, should those, when you are coming to repot, if we sort of explain the, the process of repotting, should those um, orchid roots be trimmed before you put them into the pot, or are they integral to the to the new new potting no, regime? No, um, um, mm, I was uh, I was about to say dramatic never, <laughs> <laughs> but you you modified a little bit the question at the end, and that 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 so um, uh, the answer will be diplomatic yes and no. <laughs> when you grow the orchid at your home and it has some aerial roots, don't worry, that's what they do. You do not cut these roots. You 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 spray them with orchid mist or with soft water, mm -hmm. and to keep them nice and moist and green until time comes to repot it. If you have an awful lot of 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 aerial roots, then look at the pot. If you can see a lot of nice, good-looking roots inside the pot, chances are it's time to repot. If what you see in the pot is darkness. <laughs> You can't see many roots, mm -hmm. etc. Chances are you have been overwatering. The plant doesn't like it and, may, and makes all its new roots on the outside. Again, it's good to report, mm -hmm. but for different reasons. Adjust your watering as well. The, the, the reporting is a function of time because the main reason you report an orchid is to change the bark because the bark, however good it is, it, it degrades with with the fertilizer, with the, with the watering, etc., etc. It, it degrades. It starts becoming mushy and starts holding too much water. She, orchids between watering needs, needs to breathe. So that happens with time, and it takes about two years for the bark to replace. So orchids need reporting every two years, either in the spring or in the autumn, not in the middle of the summer or the middle of the winter. That's why we don't do these MOTs or orchid talks either in the middle of the summer or the middle of the winter. So from February to April, May, and then September, October. September better than October. Yeah, so same Manus, um, you mentioned about your, um, your, your orchid bark. Um, now, there's obviously, most gardeners are familiar with garden bark and chip bark. Um, obviously, your bark used in, in growth technology products is, is, is different. It is different. Is um, The bark we used for orchids in... Uh, First of all, the, the bark we use is, is bark that is used at commercial nurseries. But the, the chip bark, you say, is, is, is big pieces, is mostly from the outer. Uh, it, it's bark, but it's also a lot of wood, which will tend to, to rot, and that's not good inside the, the pot. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a couple of other products. Again, I, I know there's another product uh, around. It's 80% uh, bark, 20% wood. But the wood inside the pot will rot, and that is... And rotting takes away nitrogen, so that is that is not good. The, what is great about orchid bark in general, and, and orchid focus reporting mix in particular, it, it is that it is grated bark, it is pine bark, it is fumigated, and ideal for orchids is is condition. Whereas the landscape bark is is not graded, and it's not it's not good quality bark. Is is um in this life like everything you know you. you Get what you pay for. It is from the outer area of the uh, um, of the tree rather than proper bark. Yeah, no, I understand. Um, so you, you're growing your orchids on the windowsill. I suppose the, the perennial question is, how long is that plant going to live for? Is is there a, a finite answer to that? Or no, there, there is no there is no reason that that the plant will uh, will die. The, the most common reason that that orchids die, uh, like all other house plants, is basically over watering. People mm -hmm. confuse love with watering. I <laughs> love my orchid, I'm going to water it. Uh, no, just, just 
look at it. Yeah. That's 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 what I do. Uh, um, look at it. See any signs of, of I don't know pests, or see if it tries if it tries to tell you something. I mean, I'm looking at um, at a young cosette I have here on my windowsill, mm-hmm. and it's leaning towards the light. That tells me it's not enough light. So. Yeah. A lot of times, the, the, the plants will, will tell you things. I look at under the under its pot, I'll see roots coming out. That tells me that it needs a bigger pot. Um, and so on. It, it, I say looking at the plant, trying to figure out what it tries to tell you, is much better than just giving it water for the sake of it. Especially with moth orchids, as I said earlier, it will tell you when it needs watering. Most definitely. Now, obviously, moth orchids are probably, well, they are the most popular house plant now. I think they've always been the, the top 10 flowering plants for, for a number of years. If you were going to give our uh, our uh, podcast audience a, a tip maybe to grow a, a, another orchid, what, what would you sort of recommend having on the back of having success with their, uh, their phalaenopsis, their more moth orchids? The best tip is consider where you want to place the orchid. Mm-hmm. and then ask the garden center what orchid would go in these conditions. For example, if there was a person who had a flat with no outside with no outside area, you can't grow a cymbidium because cymbidium needs to go out. Assuming, you know, that there's a lot of conditions you can, or you can, you know, you can, you can, um, you can, uh, give the plant, one of my favorite orchids would be Cymbidium. There are big orchids with big showy flowers. They flower in the middle of the winter for three or four months. And the trick to them is very simple. You need to take them outside. Right now, I'm keeping an eye on the weather like every gardener does. As soon as the temperature, I'm waiting for next week, I see the temperature, the night temperature stabilized about 10 degrees and above. I have four Cymbidiums, one is still in flower from Christmas. How many months is it now? Five months, almost five months in flower. Mm -hmm. I would take them outside. I'll take them by my shed, which is sort of north facing, so they don't get too much light. They get a couple of hours light in the morning, and that's that's plenty. And then as soon as the temperature starts dropping regularly below 10 degrees in October, I'll bring them in and reward me with some beautiful flowering, as I said, in uh, in the middle of the winter. If somebody wants an orchid for, for their office, and their office is office is a good place, for, for example, for Cambrias, because Cambrias don't need the warm temperatures of Phalaenopsis. They like temperatures as low as 10 degrees between, between flowerings. And in the office, we only have Cambrias, because the, uh, and the flower profusely, they do magnificently, because our offices are not overly heated, during the night, the, the temperature does drop. The thermostat is at ten degree at, at ten degrees, mm-hmm. so they get this cold temperature and 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 they thrive. That's good. So the, I'll say, these are two other uh, two options, but mm-hmm. consider whether you can give give them what they want. Cymbidiums, big, showy, need to go outside in the in the summer, or cambrias for cooler areas of the of the house right? the porch that window between mm-hmm. between floors which is away from a radiator or a spare room these are ideal places for cambrias who come in a variety of colors and uh, flower shapes excellent and uh, i have to say i've been reading your book manos which was uh, which was written with peter white who i think is the ex-president of the orchid society of uh, great britain the book's called Growing Orchids at Home, A Beginner's Guide. I really enjoyed reading it, and it's very it's very photographic. There's lots of pictures, and I think a, a picture you know, says a thousand words, especially when you're looking at problem issues, like you've mentioned about uh, issues with overwatering and, and such like. So um, why should our <laughs> listeners buy your book, Manus? Because it's so, I don't know what saying. Well, I think it's great. It's a great read, and it, it's, um, it's, a, it's a nice open format. You can dip in, dip out, which I... I love, love book, those books, and there's some really nice pictures uh, in as well. Uh, simply <laughs> because it's the best. <laughs> uh, no, uh, um, seriously, look, it, it includes all the good expert advice that many other books have, uh, definitely. But what is unique about the book, and, and took us a lot of time, but at the same time, a lot of enjoyment, is we took more than 100 unique pictures. And as you say, pictures of ill orchids, 
um, and, and we said, why this happened? What can you do about it? And that is not an easy thing to do, and nobody else has done it. No. And we have done it because we give these talks all over the UK. A lot of times, somebody would come with an orchid and say, oh, what is wrong with this? I say, X, Y, Z. By the way, how about if I buy, if I buy for you a brand new orchid, you give me this old one? Yeah, okay, I'll have that. And then we amassed an awful lot of, of, of ill orchids. We take pictures and I say, we said, this is what, what, um, what is wrong. This is what, what you need to do. Also, at these talks that we do, both me and Peter throughout the UK, uh, we get asked a lot of questions. So we put all these questions into the book and answer them. So uh, uh, people can get all the, the good, uh, good uh, information. Um, and uh, also, it, I mean, it, 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 it's published by Q Gardens, which, which speaks uh, volumes about its, its quality, dare I say. And, and at the very last page of the book, I put my email. So if people have a problem, and I have quite a lot of people actually that send me uh, uh, buy the book, oh, by the way, uh, how about uh, my orchid? And they send me a picture and we get into communication about, you know, what can you do, et cetera, et cetera. So That's overall, cool. Overall, I think it's um, it's, a, it's a great book. Very uh, proud of it. And yeah, no, it's it's a, it's a really good read, and I think the pictures do help because I mean I've seen in, in gardening books where you get sort of a, a troubleshooting section, a chapter, but the way mm-hmm. you've you've addressed that and actually using photographs of of, of you know uh, customers or, or, or kids over the the visits you do to garden centres is a great way of, of, of knowing exactly what people want to to know, which is good. Um, Manners, finally, I always ask this question because I want to put you on the spot a bit, but if you could only grow one orchid on your castaway as a castaway island, (laughs) which one would you grow? Mm, Okay. Well, this particular one I have in mind, and it's a very favorite of mine, uh, wouldn't grow on a tropical island because it is a Cambria and it does need a bit of cold in its life. Um, but it, uh, it's my favorite orchid because it flowers in September for about six to eight weeks and it, it has a heavenly smell. A lot of orchids, not moth orchids as much, but a lot of other orchids have got a really, Cambrias especially, have got a really nice, beautiful uh, uh, perfume. And, and this particular one um, flowers in September when it is my birthday. And uh, a lot of times I have it in my bedroom. I wake up and the first thing I'll do is I'll, 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 I'll smell, I'll give it a, I'll take all its aroma inside. And you know what? The world, the world is a better place. Um, and it's called Oncidium Meke von Holm. It is available to buy normally in September or October when it is in flower yeah. at, at good quality garden centers. Really easy to grow. Mm-hmm. Uh, and every year, it's, that is the thing with Cambria orchids. Every year, and cymbidiums, in contrast to, to, to Phalaenopsis, they, they, they're worth a go because every year they will grow bigger and bigger with more and more flowers. I have, I have two of them, and uh, they, I have them now for seven years, and they make about 16 flower spikes every year. Wow. They only flower once a year, but for six to eight weeks, you know, they, they give you this huge pleasure. I think you've really sold that orchid, irrespective of a desert <laughs> island, yes, <laughs> which is great. Um, one last question, um, and you, you obviously right at the beginning of our interview, you chatted about your uh, your island of, uh, where you, you, know, you were born, on uh, Samos. Um, I heard that you did a little bit of um, entertaining back over in, the, in 2013 at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. <laughs> now, tell us a little bit more about this, Manus, because this is really fascinating. Uh, yeah, in the in, <laughs> in the good old times before I had two kids, <laughs> I yeah I, I did um, comedy as you know in part time as a way of, of of saying a few things about my country and about myself etc. It was it, it, it's great fun. It was it was um, uh, so I, I went to Edinburgh actually for three times. Okay, uh, I've been on BBC. I've been on the BBC radio a couple of times mm-hmm. because it was um, at the time where there was this uh, the financial crisis in Greece. So people wanted a little bit of, a, of light entertainment. Mm-hmm. They wanted to know a little bit about it, but in a funny way, rather than delving into the figures and, and, and this and that. 
So it was it was a great time, and uh, yeah, Edinburgh is it was a great experience, and and uh, I met a lot lots of people, some of them famous, and I see them now on TV, uh, etc. But at some point, I had kids, and then uh, you have to choose, you know, yep. you you it, it all became uh, too much, and so yeah, kids won. <laughs> well, well done for for giving uh, the Edinburgh Fringe a, a go, and uh, yeah, obviously three three uh, three slots. That must have been, been a great experience for you, Manos. As ever, it's been delightful to to chat with you. Um, obviously, we've we've covered an awful lot um, from uh, obviously from your early days to obviously talking about growth technology, and of course how to grow our wonderful orchids. So. Thank you very much, and uh, you know we, we look forward to seeing you very soon at the Garden Centre. We'll obviously promote our next orchid event, and uh, we really look forward to seeing you and, and Peter over the next uh, uh, few few months. Yes, excellent. Great to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, I never realised there are so many different varieties of orchids, Chris. There are even some scented ones, aren't there? There are, yes. And uh, for, for, for indoors, the ones to look out for would be oscidiums and dendrobiums. Now, okay. Now, dendrobiums we occasionally get in, um, but uh, the oscidiums are a little bit more specialist, but worth looking out for. Okay, I've not heard of them before, but yeah, I've certainly seen the dendrobiums. So. Yeah, they have a, a fruity sort of fragrance, quite uh, almost strawberry-like. Okay. Yeah, so, a bit different. Brilliant. And what about there's some other you know, orchid varieties Manos mentioned there that um, are we likely to find all of them in the, uh, the garden centres? Yeah, well, moth orchids, obviously, year-round production of those, which uh, which is great, and that's why they're probably so popular. But yes, you've got things like the uh, Cymbidium orchid, which has those amazing large flower spikes and they tend to be available in the autumn and the spring. Okay. So are orchids just for Christmas, Chris, or can we get them all year round? No, as I say, the the cymbidium really, as I say, autumn, and, and, and you you probably get that round about Christmas time. That's when you, you often see them as really nice, fine specimens. They make a fantastic... Is that the one that's sort of very... Up, you often see it very upright, sort of mm. almost like a bamboo plant, sort of lots of spikes, sort of shoots coming up and then the, the leaves coming off and yeah and, of, and often the actual individual blooms are used on on uh, wedding bouquets and such like they're quite an important to, um, sort of flower for the the flower arranging business too so the florists love them because they're so long lasting they're quite waxy as okay. well so they're long la- uh, it sounds like they'd be a good long lasting flower then mm. certainly yep good stuff and then of course you've got the uh, as i say the, the other popular varieties which you tend to see from time to time so the things like the cambria orchids and of course the slipper orchid okay um of course they tend to be available when garden centers get in um what they call mixed boxes from the the, the dutch orchards a lot of these varieties of course are grown in holland as, as manus did say and i think uh, it's important that the, these are grown as crops so often uh, the dutch um, auction market will be perhaps flooded one week with a particular type of orchid a more specialist one and they of course then make their way through the wholesalers and hopefully into your, to your local garden center so it's nearly time for our native orchids to come out uh, into flower now, isn't it? Um, they come out in is it May? Yep, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, certainly for some spring, and of course this year has been such a chilly, chilly start to the season, and I think everything they're going to be delayed. But yes, they are. Those are the things which you tend to come across, usually unexpected, and of course being uh, the uh, native hardy orchids, a lot of them are protected now under under obviously the auspices of uh, of conservation. Yeah, because you often find them in sites of scientific interest. And Mm -hmm. um, the other one that always amuses me is um, boggy verges, where the council haven't cleaned drains out uh, (laughs) for many years. And you get those sort of um, areas along the verge where they don't get any maintenance. And um, you you often find orchids popping up in places like that. Indeed. I I remember from my childhood finding that the spotted orchid, which has that wonderful, obviously, the spotted leaf, it has like a plankton-like leaf, so a long sort of hosta leaf with uh, black spots on, but these amazing sort of purple or mauve flowers. And they were actually in a a, a boggy area within a, a golf uh, course all oh, right up, up, up north and uh yeah i used to every year when i was walking my dog I used to see those uh in in, in flower and it was always around about the sort of early early part of may um and they used to last probably about three or four weeks um very very spectacular but need to be preserved not that common unfortunately so you're lucky to find them mm, definitely <laughs> good stuff so growth technology you know, have clearly put a lot of effort and um, research into the products that they make and they clearly strive to have the best quality 
products uh, on the market. Um, now, I understand um, Manus and the team and uh, Peter have been working on new projects, haven't they? Yeah, and they've brought out a really good orchid book. Uh, Excellent. It's, and it's in conjunction with Kew Gardens. Okay. So it's got a lot of uh, credence in, the, in the, the, the scientific world as well. And what I like, particularly liked about it is the fact it's very pictorial, lots of pictures. And I think it's quite important if you're looking at the, the aspect of growing orchids for problem solving, troubleshooting, I think the photographs really do say a thousand words and it makes it so much more straightforward and easier to identify the problems hitting your, your plants. That's obviously been the biggest bugbear when I've been had, I've had issues with plants in, in the past. And I think this book does it really very, very well. And Peter White and, and Manos have done a, a grand job bringing together. And uh, as, he, as, he, as he indicated in the interview, that obviously he used lots of case studies of plants showing various signs of uh, problems, shall we say, to, to photograph. So, uh, uh, yeah, a, a real working passion and it, it comes off really well. It definitely, it certainly does, and like you say, sort of, it's so much easier to sort of match your your problem up with one in a photograph than yeah. trying to describe it, isn't it? it? It is, and even though we've got the the internet now, we've got our, our smartphones. Sometimes just to actually to refer to a reference book is very reassuring, isn't it? You've got a, a proper uh, index to go to, and you can navigate through the problems, which would probably be more difficult perhaps online. So now, Chris, time for the pub quiz question. Where do vanilla pods come from? From a species of uh, orchid called vanilla. Excellent. Two points. Indeed. <laughs> and, and vanilla, um, by translation, means little pod. Okay. And for extra brownie points, uh, at your pub quiz, if you were to say that vanilla is the second most expensive um, herb, we're going to call it herb, yes, spice. Okay, I think yes, so. Why not spice or yeah. herb, isn't yeah. it? To saffron. Now, saffron obviously is another plant under yeah, definitely now that that could be a whole nother episode couldn't it could it? I mean, we could they, we, they're from crocus that's they? right yeah from the autumn autumn crocus flower flowering uh, genus so yeah so uh yeah so vanilla we we take for granted they we have to thank the yes aztecs who brought the uh, the plants to fruition there's three species which are available which obviously produce the particular types and notes is it a note of a, a spice I guess so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and that's obviously used in baking, in the perfume manufacturing, and, of course, aromatherapy. So we've got a lot to thank the, the orchid for. Definitely, because I think from memory it's the most popular scent used in like home fragrances, mm-hmm. vanilla. Definitely. So, um, But obviously a lot of those are yeah. unfortunately not natural, but no. obviously the natural stuff Indeed. is great for... Yeah. yeah. So look out, if you ever go to a, a botanic garden, if you go into any of so over at Kew or Edinburgh or every, where we are in the world, look out in the orchid house for the vanilla orchid. And hopefully it'll be flowering. Excellent. Thanks, Chris. Pleasure. I think that probably covers orchids quite well. Um, I'm uh, very happy with the, all the information I've, uh, I've learned from Manos and yourself today. So thank you very much, Chris. Thank you, Peter. Our thanks today goes to Chilton Music Therapy for providing the music for our show. At Chilton Music Therapy, we want everyone to know the difference that music can make in their lives. From parents and their premature babies in hospital to grandparents with dementia. We provide music therapy and community music services to people of all ages and needs across England. We work both digitally and in person in people's homes, care homes, schools, hospitals and hospices. Find out more at chilternmusictherapy.co.uk.